All righty, good morning. So at this point, the, um, the only suggestion or question I've gotten for potential review on Friday is, what should I study from chapter eight? Um, so I'm not going to cover, I'm not gonna give you a study guide from chapter eight on Friday. What I will tell you is that for chapter eight, what's go that's the chapter on base periodic trends, chemistry of the main group elements. Uh, the important thing to keep in mind is trends, okay? Um, knowing things like the lone pair effect in the, or the inert pair effect for P block elements, knowing the differences in acidity of various uh, hydrides of the P block elements, basic trends. I'm not going to expect you to memorize every reaction in chapter eight. Um, it's not, we didn't cover every reaction in chapter eight. I don't have every reaction in chapter eight memorized. So um, focus on trends, focus on you know, the, the main concepts that we covered in lecture and, um, and go from there. So today we're going to, I hope, finish up mostly on chapter 11, leaving us with electron counting for Friday, but we'll see how it goes. Um, we've been talking about, or the big problem that we've set up is how to interpret the electronic absorption spectra of coordination complexes that have more than one d electron. Okay, and as the the prototype we were we looked at, we've been looking at hexaqua vanadium trication, which has three electronic absorbances in the UV visible region that can all be attributed to D to D bands. They're spin allowed transitions. They're Laporte forbidden or orbitally forbidden. So we know that they're D to D transitions. From our molecular orbital diagram, it's hard, you can't explain where the three transitions come from. And so we've been employing crystal field theory. And to employ crystal field theory, you have to go all the way back to the free ion. And that is when you have two electrons in five equal energy d orbitals. Now, a thing that we often forget when we draw pictures of orbitals and we put energy diagrams up in molecular orbital diagrams, um, all of that is based on the hydrogen atom. Okay, those are all what we call one electron orbitals. Okay, it's just, we can solve the Schrodinger equation for the hydrogen atom, so we calculate what a 3p orbital would look like or what a 3d orbital would look like, and that's the pictures that we use. Okay, we can't solve the Schrodinger equation when we have more than one electron. Okay, and so then that's really where this, where the issue comes up is the, the MO diagrams that we generate are based on one electron orbitals. With crystal field theory and with the spectroscopy, it gives us the ability to start to approximate what happens when you have multiple electrons in an orbital set. And so one of the things that you have to do is consider how the two electrons interact with each other, how their orbital angular momenta couple, how their spin angular momenta couple, okay? In other words, L and S. Um, sometimes you have to worry about how their orbital and spin couple together to give you J coupling. Uh, but for our purposes, we aren't gonna worry too much about that. Using our big M sub L and big M sub S values, okay, so this is the, this is coupling the orbital angular momenta of the two electrons or the spin angular momentum of the two electrons. We figured that the 45 microstates of the D2 ion can be factored into five atomic states. These atomic states are collections of microstates that have the same energy. So even though we have two electrons in five d orbitals that are all at the same energy, there are effectively five different electronic states that are distinct, okay? 
we can represent them by these term symbols. Three of those atomic states are singlets, okay? So that's where the electrons must be paired, must have opposite spin, okay? So there's no, so there's a zero spin multiplicity. Two of those states, the triplet F and the triplet P, are where the electrons can be, have, the, have the same spin, be pointing in the same direction, okay? They can both be spin up, they can both be spin down. They can also, there's also a microstate where they have opposite spins in these, the triplet F and the triplet P. But the important thing is that they can have the spins parallel. That tells you that the electrons must be in different orbitals because you can't put two electrons into the same orbital and have the same spin. The ground state we establish is triplet F because it both maximizes the spin multiplicity and it maximizes the orbital angular momentum. The triplet F has 21 different microstates. Um, it's got the greatest microstate degeneracy and it's the, the ground state for this molecule. So then our challenge, remember all of this, these five electronic states are for the free ion where the d orbitals are all at the same energy. But we know for hexaqua vanadium trication that we have an octahedral complex and that the ligand field generated by these six water molecules causes the d orbitals to split into a non-bonding level and an anti-bonding level. The d orbitals are no longer all degenerate. And so we have to figure out how this octahedral ligand field perturbs the energies of these five atomic states from the free ion. And so to do that, last time we went through and we drew pictures. Okay. And when I put together these notes, I did it in the absolute simplest way possible. I sat down and I said, I have two electrons and I have five orbitals and what are all the combinations I can have? And I drew them all out and I looked at the sheet of paper and I said, okay, well, can we then figure out what the differences in the interactions are? And it becomes obvious, or it should, that seven of the orbital combinations minimize electron-electron interactions by putting the electrons in different planes of the vanadium ion, right? In all of these cases, all of these microstate or these orbital combinations that belong to the triplet F, the, electron, the two electrons of the vanadium are as far apart as possible because they're localized in different planes. Three orbital combinations put those electrons in the same plane because electrons have negative charges. Putting the two electrons in the same plane of the vanadium ion is going to cause a repulsive energy. And so these three orbital combinations make up the triplet P atomic state, which is higher in energy than the triplet F. Okay, so that's how we separate out the triplet F microstates from the triplet P microstates in the free ion. The next step is to put the octahedral ligand field on top of this as a perturbation. And again, once we have these things all drawn out, it's easy to go through and say, this orbital, this dxy orbital, belongs to the T2g, it's a non-bonding orbital, this dxz, also belongs to the T2G, it's non-bonding. And we can go through each of these seven orbital combinations plus these three orbital combinations and assign the character of the orbital in the octahedral ligand field. Once we've done that, we can add the energy term. We can decide what energy perturbation the ligand field brings if the orbital belongs to EG, that means an electron in this EG type orbital is going to be 
destabilized by delta O energy. And so we can write very simple energy equations to approximate where each of these microstates is going to be in energy once we apply the octahedral field. And so that led us to this diagram. On the far left of the slide, we have the so-called free ion, the vanadium trication with two d electrons. I guess I should have put the electrons in there, but with two d electrons gives rise to five atomic states. The difference in energy between these atomic states is just electron-electron repulsion. All the d orbitals are at the same energy. So the only thing that separates the triplet F from the triplet P is that repulsion associated with putting two electrons in the same plane of the ion. You can make similar arguments about the energy of this singlet D, the singlet G, and the singlet S. For those, it's not just the plane, the plane that the electron is oriented in, but you actually have pairing energies where you can put two electrons into one orbital. But all of these energy separations are just electron-electron repulsion, due to electron-electron repulsion. As soon as we introduce a ligand field, as soon as we go from <laughs> spherical symmetry to octahedral symmetry, the d orbitals become inequivalent. dz squared and dx squared minus y squared make up the eg. xz, yz, and xy make up the t2g. They're going to be at different energies. The eg is going to be higher. But this middle position right here is what we call the weak field limit. We have an octahedral field, but the value of delta O is very, very small. Okay, We can say it's almost zero, just enough that we can see the difference in the energy of these two levels. When we introduce this octahedral ligand field, it breaks the symmetry, OK? Spherical is the highest symmetry we can have. Going to an octahedron breaks that down. It's cubic. It's still a very high symmetry, but it's less than spherical, OK? Just like the d orbitals are no, just like the fact that these are no longer degenerate once we go to the octahedron, the two triplet states break down because of the symmetry. The triplet F decomposes into three different states, a triplet T1G, a triplet T2G, and a triplet A1G. The triplet P actually comes across and maintains its triplet T2G configuration. Your textbook talks about how to get these labels, and they correspond to the way that we, we, the way that we put electrons into these molecular orbitals. Now, you'll notice here that I kept the three electronic states that came from the triplet F. I kept them very close in energy, much lower in energy than this triplet T2G. That's because the splitting here is still very small compared to electron-electron repulsion. That's not always the case, though. In fact, usually the ligand field imposes a greater energy, has a greater energy perturbation than electron-electron repulsion. And so we can come over here to the right side of the diagram, and this is the strong field limit. On the right side of this diagram, we would say that delta O, the splitting between T2G and EG, is large, much larger than the electron-electron repulsion term. And so what we see now is that one of these 
electronic states from the triplet F basically stays low in energy, stays the ground state, this triplet T1G. One of the states, the triplet T2G, goes up. You see a basically a one-for-one one increase in the energy of this state with the energy of the EG orbital because, again, or because this state corresponds to having one electron in EG and one electron in T2G. The triplet A1G that came out of the triplet F free ion state goes up twice as fast so that in the strong field limit, it's the highest energy state. And we can look at the electron configuration of that state. Zero electrons in T2G and two electrons in EG. Effectively, that triplet A1G state is when you have both electrons up here in EG. The energy of that state, therefore, is going to be 2 delta O. Finally, you have the triplet T2G that came from the triplet P free ion state. You'll notice that it also goes up. It actually parallels the triplet T2G from the triplet F atomic state. Goes up one for one with the increasing ligand field strength so that when we get to the end, the strong field limit here, it's exactly 15B higher in energy than the triplet T2G from the triplet F free ion state. The exact same energy separation of the triplet F and the triplet P in the free ion. So what we end up with, what this is telling us, is that we have two electronic states. Both of these electronic states have an electron configuration that contains one electron in T2G and one electron in EG. In other words, both of those states correspond to this. It just depends on whether you also include an electron-electron repulsion term because the electrons are in the same plane. So if the specific configuration, if the specific microstate is to have an electron in XZ and an electron in Z squared, that configuration puts the electrons in the same plane. It's part of that state that triplet T2G derived from the triplet P. If the specific microstate has an electron in XY and Z squared, well, that's different planes. That specific microstate or electron configuration belongs to that triplet T2G, the one that was derived from the triplet F. And so, Two notable things come out from this diagram. First of all, we know that we have this triplet T1G ground state. Okay? That again corresponds to the different ways that you can put two electrons into this T2G orbital. There's basically three different combinations. Okay? That's going to be the ground state. That's no surprise. From that ground state, though, look, we have one, two, three different excited states, three different possible electronic transitions that corresponds to the three different photon energies we measure in the UV visible spectrum of the hexaqua vanadium ion. Those three transitions correspond to one, two, three excited states that exist in this molecule. It's kind of neat. The lowest energy transition we can predict is a direct measurement of delta O. We can appro that's a good approximation. The second transition from the ground state to the second excited state is delta O plus 15B. 
the energy of the electron-electron repulsion. The highest energy transition should be exactly or exactly or fairly close to twice the lowest energy transition because it's 2 delta O. Now it turns out that every D2 ion in an octahedral field will have an electronic state diagram that looks just like this. Doesn't matter what the metal is, doesn't matter what the ligands are, if it's a D2 ion in an octahedral field, it will look just like this. The only things that change are the magnitude of B, okay, because it's going to depend on the size of the metal and everything else, and delta O, the octahedral ligand, uh, ligand field splitting, because that depends on both the metal ion and the nature of the ligand that comes in. So to accommodate the fact that the, the basic diagram doesn't change, but just the, the magnitude of these energies, the magnitude of these energies does change, you'll often see these state diagrams collected in what's known as a Tanabe-Sugano diagram. So first things first, in this Tanabe-Sugano diagram, I'm only showing the triplet electronic states. I've just gotten rid of all the singlet states because we know that we can't see those states spectroscopically because it requires a spin flip. So over here, well, let's start on the x-axis of the Tanabe-Sugano diagram. We have the value delta O over B. So the x-axis gives you the octahedral ligand field splitting, or the crystal field splitting, in units of B. Okay, we effectively, delta O is going to be a measurement in energy. B is going to be measured in energy. If we divide delta O by B, we count, cancel out our energy units and we're left with a scale that runs from 0 to 40. The y-axis, we have energy divided by B. The E in this case is the energy of the electronic transition. It's the energy that you measure from your spectrometer. Not the wavelength, the energy. Okay. Again, we divide it by B so that we get rid of whatever energy units we're using. And we get a scale, a scalar on the y-axis to go along with our scalar on the x-axis. So now it should make sense to you if we come along here on the x-axis down to a value of delta O over B equal to zero, well, that's telling you that Delta O is zero. It's effectively the free ion. There's no octahedral ligand field. And so at zero, we put our triplet F as the ground state and our triplet P as the excited state. That separation, if you excuse the fact that that got shifted a little bit, that triplet P, that separation between the triplet F and the triplet P is exactly 15B. As we move from left to right along the x-axis, we're increasing the strength of the ligand field. Delta O is becoming larger. And what we see happen is our triplet F splits into three electronic states, the triplet T1G, which we normalize so that it's always zero because it's always the ground state. We have our triplet T2G in purple here. Okay, this is the state that corresponds to one electron in T2G and one electron in EG, but so that the, so the electrons are in different planes. And then the green is the triplet A1G that corresponds to both electrons being promoted up to the EG orbital. 
you'll notice that this purple line is a one for one increase or close to a one for one increase. It's a line with a slope of one. The separation between the ground state triplet T1G and this triplet T2G is always delta O. Similarly or analogously for the triplet A1G, the slope of this is about two and the separation from the ground state to the triplet A1G is always approximately two times delta O. The triplet P, free ion state, as we said on the last slide, stays together as a triplet and becomes a triplet T2G in octahedral symmetry. Again, this electronic state corresponds to an electron in T2G and an electron in EG, just with the electrons in the same plane. So it's always 15B higher than the purple state. Yeah? Why did you choose to measure the delta O after 25? Uh, delta O is 80. Oh, I, no, it's, I'm just showing, I mean, that was just to make the slide look pretty. <laughs> then, uh, so does, it, does delta O change? What's delta O changing? Delta O across the bottom is change. That's what the x-axis is, right? We're effectively taking delta O in units of B. So if delta O is 5 times B, then it's here. If it's 25 times as large as B, then we're here. Okay, so that's... The x-axis, that's the beauty of it, is it gives us the sliding scale of delta O. It shows what happens to the separation between the states as delta O gets five times larger than B, 10 times larger than B, 20 times larger than B. Okay, but everywhere along this x-axis, you can measure a delta O value. It's just a delta O in units of B. So we're, we're going to go through a sample problem where I give you a delta O value and I give you a B value and we calculate where the electronic transitions should be. More normally what would happen is you would make a complex, you would measure its electronic absorption spectrum and you would have three transitions and you would have to work backwards to get and you'd solve delta O and B. Okay, so we can see now from this Tanabe-Sugano diagram, if this red line, okay, this value where E over B is equal to zero is the ground state, we can see very readily how we get three different transitions to the first excited state, to the second excited state, or to the third excited state. It's kind of an unfortunate color choice there. <laughs> so page 434 of your textbook, I think that's the up-to-date page, um, shows you how to go through and fit when you have these three transitions, how to go through and fit the data and figure out exactly how to calculate delta O and B based on these three transitions. You basically have to play a trick, okay, um, which is to take two, the energies of two transitions and take a ratio of them and it will tell you where on this sliding scale of delta O over B you are. When you take that ratio, you have to be clever. You cannot take the ratio of E3 to E1 because as the diagram shows, that's 
that ratio is always going to be 2. Right? You basically are going to have 2 delta O divided by delta O. It's always going to be 2. But if you take the ratio of E2 to E3, that one will give you, that one changes as you go across the diagram. Again, your book will work you through the problem. Oh, I thought I actually had it. Oh, I have a different problem coming up. Um, we'll come back to a different sample problem after uh, this slide. So that was D2. I hope it's obvious to you why we ended up with three electronic transitions. Um, D2 is pretty much the simplest of the multi-electron states. D3 isn't much more complex. It's a little bit more complex, a little bit less obvious, but it's still fairly straightforward. It turns out that D8, D9, D9 looks just like D1. There's only one possibility, one, elect one hole that can move. D8 looks just like D2. D4 through 7, they kind of suck. Right? If you remember, D4 through D7, those are the electron counts where you can, the complex can either be high spin or low spin. The Tanabe Sugano diagram has to take that into consideration. And so if we consider D7, so if we have seven electrons, only five orbitals, we have two different cases. The first case is the high spin case. It's when you put all the electrons in so that you can maximize the number of unpaired electrons. That happens when delta O is small relative to the electron pairing energy. It's going to happen, right? So here's a Tanabe Sugano diagram, or part of it, for the D7 ion. The x axis is delta O over B. Okay? So when delta O over B is a small ratio, yes, delta O of 5B or 10B or even 20B is considered a small ratio, you're in the high spin case. You have a ground state free ion term for D7 of quartet F. You have an excited state of quartet P You'll notice, unlike the last time, I've included this doublet G, free ion state. Right now, it's kind of grayed out. In the high spin case, the quartet F splits into, and when we introduce octahedral symmetry, the quartet F splits into three different electronic states. The quartet P, becomes a quartet T1G. We go along. This quartet T1G is the ground state. What does it correspond to? Well, this is a D7 ion. OK, we have five D orbitals. We're talking about the high spin case. So we put the first five electrons in, all spin up. We have two electrons left over. And they go spin down into the T2G orbital. So if you think about it, in some ways it looks similar to a D2 ion. We get the same three states here. T1G, a T2G, and an A2G. From a, an F state, the P state becomes a T1G. We're going along. We're increasing the strength of the ligand field. The states are splitting out in energy, just like we've seen before, until we get to this cliff. 
Now you could say, well, maybe D7 is just funny and delta O can never be bigger, delta O over B can never be bigger than 18. It's probably not the case. Because if you have good eyes, you see that something else is happening. In this case, I put the doublet G in here. It splits by the ligand field, but again, in a high spin complex, we can't do a transition from a quartet ground state to a doublet excited state. Spin forbidden. But nevertheless, as the octahedral ligand field increases, look, there's a, here's the gray line. This is the lowest energy electronic state that comes out of that doublet G. It's coming down, it's coming down, it's coming down. Now, do you think it's possible to have an electronic state at a negative energy relative to the ground state? No. You get this discontinuity here. Okay, I said all that. And you effectively, you get this discontinuity in the diagram. Because as soon as this state coming out of the doublet G crosses your quartet T1G, you transition from a high spin molecule to a low spin molecule. And the state indicated by this blue line, a doublet EG, becomes the ground state. What does that doublet EG look like? Well, again, we have seven electrons, 5D orbitals. We put six electrons all paired up into T2G, and we have one left over that goes up into the EG. That's the ground state electron configuration for a low spin D7 compound. If the doublet EG is the ground state. We then have four excited states, a doublet T1G, a doublet T2G, and a doublet A1G that correspond to the excited states. Now what happened to these quartet states? Well, we can see the red line was coming across, coming across is the ground state, we get to this crossing point and this red line starts going up in energy because the energy of this state is now measured relative to this doublet EG ground state. The purple quartet T2G becomes that gray line that takes off in energy. You can co correlate all of the quartet electronic states that are active in the high spin compound to states in the low spin compound, which we can no longer see. All of these electronic states, these doublet electronic states, come out of the doublet G free ion state. The position of this break is consistent for any D7 ion, okay? It's going to occur, it's right around 21 or 20 delta O over B. But of course, the magnitude of delta O and the magnitude of B are going to change depending on the metal ion, the ligands, so on and so forth. Good question, right? So on the left-hand side of the diagram, it looks like a situation where we should have one, two, three transitions. And that's what you nominally see, will see for a high spin D7 ion. On the right-hand side for the low spin, we clearly have three excited states, and so technically, yes, you're correct. There should be three transitions 
in the visible region that we can ascribe to D to D transitions to these three different excited states. Now, that's technically. In the real world, we have certain issues with doing experiments, one of which is resolution, right? Resolution, how close can two things be where you can still separate them? And what we, what we observe is that the transition from the ground state to the doublet T1G and the ground state to the doublet T2G, we can't resolve those. So they, because they appear so close in energy that we just can't see the difference. Yeah? So then you can tell if it's high spin and low spin based on the absorption spectra? It has that, that's, yep. In, with a caveat, right, because you could go through back to this side and say, well, what happens if my delta O over B value is right here at about 14? We end up with the same problem. It's a resolution. We can't, right, because these two are crossing right here, we're not going to be, we're going to see two absorptions rather than three. And so, but yes, that the whole point of this is that the electronic absorption spectrum can tell you exactly whether it's a high spin or a low spin compound, assuming that you, know, you have a little bit of luck and you know how to analyze the problem. Yeah? Would it be better to look at the wavelength of where it absorbs? Because the ones that are lower in energy are going to have a larger wavelength. The ones that are lower in energy are going to have Yes, so in general, that's true. You're going to have higher energy absorptions, D to D absorptions for low spin compounds than you do for, for high spin compounds. Um, though, remember on this diagram, what we're looking at is delta O over B. And so if B is larger, that can force the ratio smaller, right? It's the important thing for high spin versus low spin is the magnitude of delta O relative to the magnitude of the electron-electron repulsion. So in a small ion, the electron-electron repulsion can be higher, and so that can muddle things. The other problem, of course, that you run into, and again, this is everything in science seems to be this way, there aren't a whole lot of complexes that lie over here, and there aren't a whole lot of complexes that lie over here. However, there's a ton that lie right around here, okay, where you're playing on either side of the line, and it becomes difficult to know exactly. The, the magnitudes end up looking very similar. Any other questions? So if you look in the back of your textbook, the Tanabe-Sugano diagrams for octahedral complexes in every possible electron configuration are known. Okay, there's also a relationship where the D2 looks just like the D8, the D3 looks similar to the D7, except for the whole high spin, low spin thing. Um, a given Tanabe-Sugano diagram is really, it's very sensitive to the geometry, okay? So the ones that you have in your textbook are all for octahedral complexes. If you read the chapter in your textbook, which you should be doing, it'll tell you there's a relationship between an octahedral Tanabe-Sugano diagram and a tetrahedral. They're kind of inverted from one another. Um, you should be able to convince yourself that that should be true because the MO diagram looks like of a tetrahedron looks like it's inverted from an octahedron. Uh, but certainly if you go to a different geometry, then the way these electronic states split from the free ion changes and it becomes a more complicated problem. Okay, the promised sample problem. Hexamine cobalt dication has a delta O value of 10,000 wave numbers and a B value of 920 wave numbers. How many transitions and, and at what energy do you expect to observe them? 
Okay, so again, this is kind of a backwards way to, to do the sample problem because if you were to actually go into the lab and make a measurement, you would measure the transitions and want to calculate delta O and calculate B. But for the first pass, we'll, we'll go through it in this backwards way where we're giving you the delta O and the B value. Um, it's a good problem because it means we have to figure out the oxidation state for our cobalt and how many D electrons it has. So this is a good freshman chemistry problem. We know that we have six ammonia ligands on the cobalt. They're all neutral Lewis bases. So we can basically just remove those and say that we have cobalt with a plus two charge. We know that cobalt is in, well, the ninth row of the periodic table, seventh row or seventh column of the transition metal series. So it must be a D7 complex. Once we have the electron count, we need to calculate delta O over B. Conveniently, it's D7 since we just got done looking at the D7 Tanabe Sugano diagram. So, simple math 10,000 wave numbers divided by 920 wave numbers gives us a ratio of delta O over B of about 11. So since we just finished looking at the D7 Tanabe Sugano diagram, we remember that that pretty much puts us in the high spin configuration. Whoa, what happened there? Okay, so here's our Tanabe Sugano diagram. What the heck? Oh. It would help if I hit the forward button instead of the backward button. That's the problem. Okay, looks the same. Okay, so we have a D7 ion with delta O over B is equal to 11. We come to our Tanabe Sugano diagram and we say that delta O over B of 11 is about right here. And so we can expect to see three transitions assuming that we have a spectrometer that has suitable resolution to differentiate between the blue and the green arrows shown on this slide. The first transition is from the quartet T1G to the quartet T2G. We can come horizontally across and read off that E1 over B is going to be approximately equal to 10. From the problem, we know the value of B. It's 920 wave numbers. So 10 times 920 wave numbers tells you that the lowest energy transition should appear at about 9,200 wave numbers. The second transition is going to be from the quartet T1G, in this case, to the quartet T2G, or sorry, quartet A2G. So that's kind of interesting because it's telling you that the electron configuration where we move two electrons is lower in energy than this quartet T1G. Right, because this gap here is effectively 2 delta O. But again, we come across to the y-axis. In this case, E2 over B is 18. 18 times 920 wave numbers tells you that this transition will be observed at about 16,500 wave numbers. We calculate the energy of the third transition in the same way. That should be at E2, by the way. E2 is equal to 18B. The third transition is to that 
to the state indicated by the green line, the quartet T1G. Again, this is probably, it's probably going to be hard to resolve this transition separate from the one to the blue quartet A2G state, but we can calculate it, of course. In this case, E3 over B is about 23. And we calculate that that's, that the energy of the third transition should be at about 21,000 wave numbers. It's probably about 480 nanometers. Okay, so we've seen now how to go through and calculate. We would calculate the presence of three transitions based on the, the state diagram or the Tanabe Sugano diagram, and we can estimate the energy at which they come through. If you take this and divide by two, you should get about delta O. Actually, sorry, the previous one should be about delta O. Um, and so you can correlate those to the to the appropriate electronic states. We will stop here, cover Jan Teller distortions on Friday along with electron counting. Have a great day.